1972 Deathline has got to be one of the most underrated gems of British horror. When we think about British horror that's lesser known, we think about films like The Wicker Man or The Shout, independent films that people think of as lost little wonders in a cavern of shining jewels. But Deathline, to all intent and purposes, feels like it shouldn't be there. And yet, when you experience it for the first time, you think, what happened to this film? Why is this film so much more well known? And indeed, one of the reasons that the people who created it at the time must have felt that way as well is because they overvalue Christopher Lee in the film. So for any of you who are hoping to see a magnificent performance from Christopher Lee, you just get a little tiny taste of him being quite an asshole. And you are a master of the overstate. Now I think it's time you were on your way, Inspector. This is my manor and the villains in it are mine. Well, you're welcome to them, old thing, so why don't you just run along and arrest a few? However, the film itself challenges cinema in so many different ways. From the first moment, you feel like you're in a seedy Soho grindhouse porn flick. <laughs> However, we very soon get away from the glaring lights of Soho, the seedy bowler hat OBE and the incredibly nasty synth music, an experience of a relatively traditional mystery horror film. Something's going on, someone's gone missing, what's happening? Are you sure he was alive when you left him? How many times? Are you absolutely certain he didn't come up after you? Yeah, you mean he did? He did not. Here is where it all changes because we have two young people who are up against Donald Pleasance as the most hilarious, magnificent, witty cop you have ever seen. This is easily his tour de force performance and the script he has been given is phenomenal. He is absolutely witty beyond belief. And this kind of traditional paradox of these two people coming together um, oppositionally to solve a mystery is heightened and then it explodes when we find out the secret to the mystery, which I'm going to tell you because it gets revealed pretty early. But basically what happens is when you get an industrial company to pay people to build the new underground train station to British Museum and then they go bust, they don't care about the people that they're supporting. What happens to those people when they get trapped in that underground chamber and yet continue to procreate and more importantly, continue to eat? So what we have here is an underground world of the London TFL cannibal, the new and greatest monster ever, except from 1972. The most brilliant and unique feature about this film is that this is, I believe, since Boris Karloff's Frankenstein's monster. The most tragic, empathic monster you will ever meet. This is a monster who is abject and deplorable, who is literally septicemic and is separating pus, bleeding, groaning, and tragically, poignantly, the only thing this monster can say is, mind the doors. Mind the doors. Also, the one image in this film that really makes us question what it means when we have to identify someone as human and yet they have been deprived of all of the traits and the tropes that we see as creating humanity and yet juxtapose this against the institutions that are meant to be the height of humanity such as MI5 and the police and they're considered incredibly cold and callous and so this monster is an incredibly unique monster in the canon or the repertoire of the monster that is made to make you feel and make you affected. There is fear, of course there is. It's a very abject and very visceral and gruesome area that he occupies. And yet at the same time, there is more tears, well, from me at least, that come in watching his interactions than I think from any other monster. He's not a sexy monster. He's not a gross monster. He is a human monster in a way that is far more human than any of the humanity shown by the other characters.